Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. And yes, I did just finish filming the lookbook, which is why I look like this. I got some makeup on the collar. We're not going to talk about it. My hair is starting to deflate, but you know, I think the most jarring thing is probably these contact lenses, which the light directly into them like this is when they look most alien. So uh, I guess apologies or uh, alternatively, uh, you're welcome. But today I'm going to be showing you how I've been drafting these standing and yet also folded back open collars. They can be worn in many different ways and you've seen them on several of my garments now, including the coat from my most recent lookbook, this dress, and then of course the gray and black jacket that I'll be making with you today. But this is actually quite a lot of drafting to get to, so let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. First, I'm going to be showing you how I took my basic bodice block and added this collar onto it, made this crossover front large open collared or large standing colored, depending on how you're folding it, pattern. And then I will show you how I used that pattern to make this jacket. So first we're going to make, we're going to add the collar onto this pattern basically. So here I have a mirrored front tracing of my basic bodice block with its darts. I've drawn those in in brown for us, but the first step I'm going to do is moving those darts around a little bit. I have my uh, like first version of this pattern sitting to the side of me so I can reference and see exactly what I did the first time I did this when I got it right finally because I did do several rounds to figure out how to not only draft this collar style for myself but how to explain it in a little bit clearer way so ugh, we'll see how I do today you know fourth time is the charm but I have my purple marker out now and I'm moving my darts over I'm shifting them towards the side seam one inch so that's what I'm doing there and then I'm going to create a princess seam down the center front of this up into the shoulder so I'm coming out two inches from my original neckline connecting that down to that new dart leg through my apex like so. Um, now this is going to be an asymmetric front, which is why I have, well, it's not really asymmetric, but uh, a fold over front, like almost like a double breasted kind of front. So that's why I have this other side traced as well. But on this other side, the right hand side here, you can see I just added seam allowance along this line because that's not gonna be sewn to the side over here. It's just going to be overlapped. So you'll see what I mean later on. And of course, we're going to eliminate this side dart on the left hand side here as well when we turn this into a shoulder princess. Let's go ahead and cut this buddy out so that we can start moving some things around like the dart. So just cut off this extra we don't need over here. I added seam allowance to that side that will be like free hanging, of course. So I cut down from the shoulder. I cut into the side dart to the apex. I'm going to slide that side dart closed, close that buddy up because I need to know, like I need to have a dart up here um, and might as well just use the side darts amount of fullness. So I'll fill this in like so with some extra paper before we even cut apart this buddy because I need to know how big this triangle needs to be basically I suppose or decide how big this triangle needs to be using dart fullness. So I've moved the side dart up into the shoulder just tape down the floop of the side dart here because it's now up here in the shoulder instead. Now this waist dart I also can remove because this is a princess seam so it's just going to be a uh, style line in the end as opposed to having any darts so I can remove that and cut up this line here this dart leg uh, I just want to leave this dart fullness chilling on the side front piece for now but the rest of this is going to need seam allowance just like any regular princess seam would so let's go ahead and add that on just so we cannot get lost and confused and forget honestly so putting the seam allowance on here all right let me just tape on some of this extra up at the top because I know I'm going to need it eventually I'll address that later, but this, you know, still would create some cone for the bust, at least from the waist to the apex, but above the apex, it would make, you know, a, a very large funnel neck at this point, um, which it's still fine. You can make it as is like that. Um, it's just gonna have a very open falling apart neckline. Um, we just want to make it fit a little bit better over the bust, which we will do in a minute, but I'm tracing a copy of the back here and I want to grab my front pattern just to mark how wide the shoulder seam ended up on the front uh, between like the arm side and this shoulder bit here where the dart is. Just mark that onto the back so I know what this needs to be to match up. So it's about an inch and a half out from the back neckline at this point. And then I just lowered that a half inch at the center back neck as well. I'll just cut that out and then I can measure my back neckline. Looks like it's 4.5 inches. So I will need that reference point. Let me just square off a starting line with a bit of seam allowance here on a spare, pe spare piece of paper. Mark the center back on this paper and I'm going to come out that four and a half inches and draw that in. That is going to be my shoulder uh, line of reference for my shoulder where the shoulder seam will end up on this collar the back 4.5 inches I'm going to measure my regular bodice block without any modifications front to get a baseline for the front it's going to be four and a half as well and um, so that's the front neckline here I'm going to use my French curve to tip that up a half inch at the end just because that's how stand collars are done alas 
Um, and I'm going to need this original line that I drew up from this point that's um, perpendicular to the rest of the collar, and I'm going to need this little angled line I just drew. So I'm going to need both of those from the original collar base, and then I have a line perpendicular 90 degrees to the tipped up collar, tipped up front edge of the collar. And I'm going to need both of these front edges in the end to dictate what I'm going to do when I cut this collar piece apart from the bodice later. So I do need both of those lines, weirdly enough. But I can just add seam allowance onto this collar piece here. I'm going to leave the front of this just long for now. You'll see what's about to happen. This collar is going to get taped on to the rest of the pattern and then taken off again just to get all of our angles correct. And I'll show you that whole process. So I'm just going to cut this out with its seam allowance. And then we can finish up this piece by using some of the dart fullness from the original pattern that we just made and adding it onto here. So here's my stand collar. Here's my bodice pattern. So I'm going to connect this to the side front for now, like temporarily at the shoulder seam. So that shoulder line that I put on the collar, that pivot point where that will be sewn is right here on this shoulder seam of the side front. So let me just draw in that seam allowance here so I can see exactly where that point needs to match up. This point needs to match up right here. And I'm going to pivot this until the uh, tipped collar front matches the angle of the dart. Hopefully you saw what I mean by that. Um, I'll replay it for you now. Tip this up to match the front here, tape that down. Now, if I were to match up my apex on between these two seams and walk this line up, I can go ahead, even just use my awl to put the awl on the apex and line those up and see where this collar hits on my front piece. And that's how tall I need to make this piece. So that's what I'll do here to find how tall this piece needs to be. And I'm going to make it have a bit of an angle. So it comes down about a half inch on this side. This side is only an inch and a half. The other side is about two inches. And that tips down just so that um, it's not too tall in front of my face. Like the angle is just helpful when it comes to having this collar folded up all the way, I suppose. But that's the easiest way I've gotten to this point so far, <laughs> trying to figure out how to draft this collar in a way that makes sense to other people. I'm just smoothing off this line up here as much as I can, walking this princess seam. Uh, as of right now, again, this collar stands completely away from the body above the bust. So I need to take a diamond of fullness out of this dart so that I can fit above the bust and yet keep the fullness in the collar. So that guideline that I left on my collar pattern, I'm using it as the guideline to draw this angle in down. And then I will add seam allowance to that. So I followed that line that was on the collar all the way down to where it hit the uh, other dart leg. And now I can cut off this diamond. <laughs> Shoot, I thought this was more understandable, but maybe not. But now I can cut this little diamond away. And so we are left with this princess seam that zigs and then zags back out. Now I'm just going to cut the little tip off of my collar here so this still matches perfectly along the princess seam. And then I can cut my collar off. I'm going to cut the collar off here, preserving the seam allowance on this side front. So the side front is now just a shoulder princess, but we have the size of triangle I need for this collar. Uh, this is the only way I've thought to do it so far, but you know, I'm sure there are other ways to describe how to do this. Ooh, I'm adding seam allowance onto that because I just cut it apart. I'll need seam allowance to put it back on. And I'm just going to round off this little bit right here. I'm just going to curve this a tiny bit so that it's not a point right there. Like so. Tape down my floops. And this whole uh, collar design or kind of jacket design was inspired by Rick Owens jackets, which look like this. Of course, there's no uh, like 1940s drafting book that shows how to do Rick Owens jackets. So I've not found actually pattern drafting instructions that show how to do this style of collar. I just had to kind of make it up um, between some flat pattern drafting, but also draping and playing around with it. And that's how I got to this point. Um, this was the most replicable way of doing this I could come up with. Um, I have tried a couple different versions of explaining this over on Patreon, and this is as good as I've gotten at explaining this so far, uh, or creating a way to do this that I can explain and you can hopefully try on your own. But to draft our actual jacket that we'll be making today, the actual sort of blazer that I'll be making today, I'm going to make a tracing of this tall funnel collar pattern that we just made. So uh, I don't want to modify this original pattern because I know it works uh, and I want to keep a copy of this to use for other jackets, other dresses in the future. So I'm going to trace a copy of that, marking my notches for my princess seams, marking everything relevant that I'll need to know to work with today that we're going to change up just a little bit and add, uh, you know, a few things onto to make it more of a jacket pattern. So I will cut out the front because the front isn't going to need that much modification um, other than just making it longer at the waist. 
But uh, for the side here, I started cutting it out and realized I wanted to add a little bit of ease into this because it will be something I wear over other garments. So I'm going to add a quarter inch along the side seam here and then lower the arm side five eighths of an inch. So that's what I've done here. So I've added a quarter inch along the side seam and I've lowered the arm side five eighths of an inch just for a little bit more cushion along the side there. If I'm wearing a sweater underneath this jacket, for example, I want to have a little bit more room in there. But again, I will just make sure my notches are still marked on this tracing and cut that out. Of course, this already has seam allowance in it because we're tracing this copy of a finished pattern. And for this center front piece, I'm going to tape on more paper here because you can see that line horizontally, that's the waistline here. And I want to add on um, so that this piece dips down below the waist, I suppose. So I'm using my A-line skirt as a reference for this. I tend to use the A-line skirt pattern as a reference for drafting like the lower half or from the waist down of jackets and blazers and dresses too. Anything that is almost like a peplum, I will use the A-line skirt pattern usually as a base for that. Sometimes I'll start with my pencil skirt pattern, either work. But I'm gonna make this about six and a half inches down from the waist. Um, of course, that horizontal seam that I'm looking at here, that's the waistline plus half inch of seam allowance. So adding six inches onto that, adding six inches onto that little bit is basically adding six and a half because there's that half inch chilling in there, which is for my seam allowance. Now for the side front, I will still have a waist seam on the side piece here, but I need to trace uh, the rest of my A-line skirt and like subtract the front from it to create the size of peplum piece I need. <laughs> this is not the easiest way to do this. Uh, well, it's a very easy way to do this for me, but it's not the easiest way to do it to explain for you. But um, luckily you've seen me make several other jackets at this point, so perhaps you're following along better than I give you credit for because I always think I'm more confusing than, and some of you seem to actually understand what I'm rambling about, so that's always good. I know it won't work for everyone, but for those whose brains work similar to mine, I guess you will be able to follow along, luckily. Let me just cut out the tracing of my A-line pattern here. I am just going to add that same quarter inch along to the side seam and let that flare out even a little bit further. Um, it's mostly going to be cut off, but because we added on that quarter inch to the side seam of the top of the pattern, I wanted to do the same on the skirt. Now I can go ahead and sketch my seam allowance on here, figure out where this would line up and then draw in like seam allowance from there. Um, I need to add an even another half inch onto here. You'll see me realize that later when I walk the seams, which is why it's always good to walk your seams and double check things to make sure you aren't getting lost. So for example, right here, I added seam allowance towards the side seam, but I need to come out towards the center another half inch. because you can see, I have seam allowance along the seam allowance edge of the bodice piece and not along the like actual seam line edge. Hopefully that makes sense. I didn't, I, 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 I won't say that this is like a beginner project, you know? I'm not gonna lie. It's not particularly difficult once you are accustomed to pattern drafting, but if you're new to it, this might be a little bit of a, a puzzle time. But now I will cut off this excess that we don't need, like so, because we're just making this to be the lower half of the front from this side front down, because the rest is all already encompassed in this center front piece. And here's where I start walking this waistline seam and I say, well, why am I half inch short? Well, you're about to find out, kid. I'm about a half inch short on here along this front line. What happened here? Let's tape that back on and take a look. Oh yeah, if I line this up, this is, I need to come out towards the center another half, there you go. There we go. That makes much more sense. Now I will trace another copy of this because on one side I'm gonna have it be curved and just rounded off like this. I think this is about nine inches long from the waist down. Nine and a half, it says at the side, um, about 10. Okay, I came down another inch, about 10, 10 and a half inches along the side here. And then I made the other side point down further in front. So I'm just gonna make a tracing of this piece. This will be like the left and the right, you know? Um, you of course don't have to make it asymmetric, but you know me. If I can add a pointy bat wing-ish Dracula ribbon, as I sometimes call them, little points to things, I will. So I can't be stopped. I perhaps should have been, honestly, it would have been fine to not add these points on the uh, one side of the jacket, but yeah. So I'm just tracing a copy of that exact piece I just made. Um, so this is front peplum A, front peplum B, um, basically, so that I can have a left and a right, one that just is longer than the other. So this side will be about an inch and a half longer and then pointed uh, near the center front. By how much? No, I didn't measure. I, I eyeballed it, you know? I'm designing on the fly here, not uh, following an official doctrine, as it were. Now for the back of this, I need to go ahead and trace a copy of my back still. So let's go ahead and do that. And then I can make some design decisions for the back as well. 
including adding a center back seam. Um, I will need to make the same changes I made to the front on this, so I'm going to add a quarter inch along the side seam and bring that arm side down five eighths of an inch again, as you can see here. I'll draw in my dart. I will use that to make a back princess seam, and I am going to add a back yoke across the back here as well. So I made that about, oh, I don't know, one, two, three, four and a half inch inches down from the neckline. Then this will be my back princess seam, and we can eliminate this dart back here. And I will have a center back seam along the center of this, which will help with creating a sort of art deco looking hemline to the back of this jacket, which was kind of an accident, but I do quite like the way it came out. So I'll probably use that detail on something else in the future. Go ahead and cut this buddy out. Of course, we are used to seeing me add yokes and separating things into princess seams at this point. I do have an entire video all about um, transforming the bodice pattern into a princess seamed version, including the front and back, and several different styles of princess seams. So I can link up to that here in a card if you would like to review princess seams in a little bit more detail. But I'm gonna add seam allowance onto my yoke here, and then I need to add seam allowance to where it needs to sew back onto the other pieces, like so. Luckily at 800 times speed here, and then I can separate my back from my side back, like so. At some point I labeled that, good for me. But now we can get rid of the start because now we have a style line instead of darts, and I can go ahead and add seam allowance on along that style line as well, because anytime we cut the pattern apart and we are planning on sewing it back together, we are going to need seam allowance. So that's what I'll do here, like so. Of course, some people don't add seam allowance to their patterns, and I always work without seam allowance, but um, once you're used to working one way, switching is has an opportunity cost I'm not willing to deal with, honestly. And I need to go ahead and extend the back of this just like I did with the front. So I'm going to go ahead and tape this onto some spare paper here. A lot of rough bits of paper being used up for this one. And again, I'm going to kind of angle this out just a tiny bit. Uh, we'll figure this out in a minute when we use the back A-line skirt pattern. I'm trying to make decisions about this. I was thinking, do I want to have a seam back here or not? And here I am thinking, let's add a center back seam. <laughs> so here I am on the fly making that change and changing my sketch as well but we will add seam allowance along the rest of this center back. Then another scrap of paper here, tape that on, kind of, come on, not so messy, please. You know, I'm kind of a speed racer, even though this footage is sped up, I'm also quite speedy in reality as well. So honestly, it's a miracle I don't make more mistakes every once in a while, um, but I'm gonna decide how long I want this piece to be. This is gonna be a little bit shorter because again, the side is gonna be a little bit longer. So this is only about six inches past the waist again, and I will cut this seam allowance off along the center back like so, I cut this to size for the back here. All right, so now we have multiple back together. I need to add side peplum piece here, and I need a tracing of my collar still, so let's just do that while I have a piece of paper big enough, make a tracing of this collar. I'm not gonna make any changes really to the collar at all. Um, it stays about the same. Just give that a trace. So we have a copy that can live with this pattern in their Ziploc bags. Sometimes I get asked, where I keep my, what I do with my patterns after I make them. I do keep them all um, and I use them again sometimes. I don't really repeat projects for here on the channel. It would be really convenient for me if I could, <laughs> but then we wouldn't have a pattern drafting section of the video, which is why many people are here. So, you know, I try and make new things only on the channel, but sometimes I will repeat projects. So I keep all my patterns. Um, I certainly have made about a billion of that wrap back top uh, at, at this point. So I've been using that pattern quite a lot but this will all go into a Ziploc bag with the sketch as the kind of like pattern cover. So I can have this to reference in the future if I need to, or just to make another one. Which of course I reused that cyberpunk jacket pattern recently and made that black and iridescent version that you saw in Saboteur, which is the same jacket that was in Synapse, which uh, is this jacket here. I'll put a link up to that video because that's a fun jacket pattern as well with lots of color blocking and weirdness going on. Color blocking and texture blocking as I tend to do. But let me trace a copy of my A-line skirt back here to use. And once again, I will like subtract along the center back what I added onto the center back of the bodice from the waist down, same as I did for the front. So this is our center back. I need to draw in my seam allowance here as a little bit of a guide. Same here along the waist of where it would have been on that back piece. And this is gonna live in here somewhere like so. So I just kind of can see what my angle needs to be here of course, the A-line skirt doesn't have any um, darts, but I can add extra flare to this by flaring this out further if I want to, um, if you want to make it even more flared than the A-line skirt typically is on its own. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. I'm coming out a little bit more because I flared this piece. It's not straight down from the waist. I added on about a half inch. So doing the same here, 
and then I'll walk the seam later to make sure everything's okay again. And nothing got out of whack. And I'm trying to decide exactly, do I want to flare this more? Do I not? What do I want? Just referencing the side uh, seam angle from my front piece. Again, need, need, need to add that uh, quarter inch along the side seam, and then I kind of flared it from there, so I just wanted to make sure I had that the same as the front peplum, and kind of using that as a reference for how long I want this to be in the back as well. Again, the one side of the jacket will be just regular curved like this, and the other side will have a point dipping down. So this is back peplum A. I will trace a copy to mirror it on the other side, and then add on the little drapey pointy thing for the center back, and then that will be back peplum B. See, last time with the cowl neck dress, pretty simple, not a very difficult modification. The rest of the dress, basically a bodice block. This, a little bit more finicky, isn't it? Wasn't too bad to do, but it's much harder to explain. But of course, uh, pattern drafting and explaining how to pattern draft, two different skills, and I am better at one than the other. So hopefully I'll get better at teaching as we go along here. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to explain. I I've said this before, it's hard to explain the creative flow side of this, because sometimes people want to know why I do something. And the answer is, I have no idea. It just felt like the right thing to do in the moment. Um, and that's just like experience coming into play. And it's something nebulous I can't exactly explain. But yes, I was walking this and making sure and then, you know, trying to make decisions. So I'm just chilling here next to the table thinking, do I want to add more flair along this back seam or not? <sighs> I just can't decide. Keep swinging this to get exactly what I want. Yeah? Yeah, I'm sure it's fine. Always try and walk your seams and true your patterns as you go in the paper version because it's better to figure out uh, like little details like that now than later when you go to sew something together and realize you don't have seam allowance. That'll really bum you out. So, And of course, if you're doing a modification as big as this, <laughs> I recommend making a muslin. Um, I did not make a muslin for this jacket, but I do still st sometimes if I move things around enough. Like I was trying to work out how to do a double princess seam recently. And I made a couple of mock-ups for that. So I will still mock things up. I don't do it often. I would say I make maybe, I don't know, four, five, four to six mock-ups a year, like muslins a year. Um, and that's out of sometimes 40 to 80 garments, uh, depending on what kind of year I'm having. So I really don't make a ton of mock-ups, but if I change the pattern this dramatically, I'm more likely to do so. Um, just to make sure I haven't forgotten anything before I cut into really delicious fabric, which sometimes I'm using fancy brocades and stuff like that, that I can't get more of. Um, this fabric, I do think they have more of it at Mood. So I will link you to this rubberized cotton I'm using today in the uh, description below. But I've just taken a tracing of my standard elbow darted sleeve pattern here. You can see how to make this pattern here on the channel. I will link up to it. I'm adding a tiny bit onto the top of the sleeve cap here, just for a little extra ease. And then I've squared off the sides of this. So um, I just, in, right at the underarm, where the uh, like sleeve cap ends, I just square that off down 90 degree angle to the hem of the sleeve, uh, parallel to the center of the sleeve, basically. And now I'm going to cut this into a two-part sleeve. So I'm gonna come out four inches from the center along either side here. Um, now, of course, this underarm has seam allowance built into it, this tracing, so I can mark that in here because we're gonna layer it closed to do this two-part sleeve. Again, you've seen me do a lot of sleeve color blocking and stuff like that on the channel here before, unless this is, again, your first video, in which case, hello, yes, I'm a mess. You know, if we can, if I can ever impart any knowledge, I feel like, wow, that was a fluke. So <laughs> um, I'm going to layer this underarm seam closed here. You can see I have an F and a B marked on here. So I don't get lost of which side of this is the front of the sleeve and which side is the back, because now it's just going to be the underside of the sleeve. And did I even bother to close that underarm dart? No, I'm just going to leave it bulky back here. I mean, you could have closed it. I could have uh, closed it very easily on this, and I probably should have so that the sleeve tipped forward a little bit more. <sighs> oh well, in hindsight, you know, could have done it. Now, because I cut this apart and I layered my uh, underarm seam allowance closed, I'm going to need to add seam allowance along this now style line. So I have an outer sleeve and an under sleeve. I need to add seam allowance along those style lines so I can sew them back together. And I did this because I did not have a ton of the rubberized cotton that I'll be using for the outside of my jacket today, and I need to find a place to like fit in some more of the black twill that I used as my collar lining. So the inside of the collar today is a um, brushed black tw cotton twill fabric. And then the underside of my sleeve is going to be that same brushed cotton twill. So it's black um, to match with like the charcoaly kind of gray of the rubberized cotton. It is a textured cotton jacquard, which is actually kind of a looser weave than I was expecting, which we'll run into later when I start sewing with it. 
um, that has a rubberized coated finish on it. So it's like kind of a laminated cotton is what we have going on here. It's not a polyester fabric, but it's not 100% cotton either. It's been laminated with like this slightly tacky, like goopy faux leather lamination on it. So I will again link you to the page for that cotton over at Mood below if they still have some in stock. But seam allowance is added on. We now have our jacket pattern. We have our uh, peplums. I can sort everything by what needs to be cut out of what here. Um, you can see I have my peplums A's and B's, which some of them are pointed down further than the other. You can draw the shape of a, you know, end of an A-line thing any way you want. You can have scallops, you can have points, you can have squares, whatever you'd like. This is our gray rubberized black cotton. Yeah, the, the base fabric is black and then the rubber coating is this charcoal gray color. Kind of looks like a tire or like wrinkled leather up close. But I'll cut everything I need out of that and then I'll cut everything out of a black rayon lining. It's not rayon, it's cupro or whatever that like recycled cotton rayon stuff is. Um, but same idea. Some rayon lining for the rest of that, rest of this. And then the front, center front pieces and the collar piece uh, of the lining I will cut out of the black twill and again the under sleeve of the black twill. The first thing I'm going to do here is put the uh, peplum A for the back and the front which is the one without the point, pin those side seams together, peplum B <laughs> which is the one with this uh, dipping point down along the front and back I will put together. So A and B left and right. I never pay attention to what's happening on the left or the right of my garment. If I ever like get the crossover of a jacket or shirt correct, it is by probably accident uh, because I don't pay much attention to what side is overlapping because in the end, the functionality is the same, whether or not it's a quote unquote feminine or masculine closure, whatever. Like which way clothes close shouldn't be gendered. Anyhow, that's uh, again, a weird thing to have gendered. So, but I will go ahead and pin my side seams together as well. So we're doing the side seams of the peplum and the side seams of the bodice part of this jacket at the same time. We're doing those first because these uh, need to be attached at the waist to their peplum pieces before they can be attached to the long center backs and the long center front along the princess seams. So before we can do the princess seams, we have to sew the waist seams of all of our side pieces together. Hopefully this makes sense. Order of operations. Another thing where it just comes intuitively to me now and I, well, I mean, it, talk about jinxing it to say I don't mess it up. I, I definitely will on my next project now that I've said that, but I don't tend to mess it up. I think through how the project needs to go together. And at this point I've sewn so many garments that I can piece that out pretty intuitively. But let me cut out my lining out of the twill. This is the lining for the fronts. And then uh, the collar I will cut out of the black twill and then the undersleeve. So here's the undersleeve and the collar. That collar I am cutting on the fold, the center back on the fold there. It's a stand collar with a bit extra coming down the front. Eh. Again, there's probably official instructions on how to do this style somewhere. I just haven't seen them or found them yet. I have been working on expanding my pattern drafting book library. Um, a lot of modern pattern drafting books, I feel like go over the basics, go over how to make a sloper, go over, go over the basics of dart manipulation and stuff, but they don't have a lot of advanced flat pattern drafting designs. Um, so I am looking for more advanced techniques or different styles. And so I often grab pattern drafting books from the 1980s or earlier um, because they tend to have different designs that were popular in each decade. And at least with the like full arrangement of books, I can hopefully have a very large library of styles to dip into when I'm wondering how to do something and can't find it on Pinterest, which is of course the first place I look. As a pretty much internet native, I'm always looking at Pinterest first, but sometimes even Google and Pinterest will fail me, which is of course distressing. And actually I will be in London soon here on vacation and I'm hoping to visit some uh, used bookstores and uh, like historic or I mean like antique bookstores I suppose and really poke around and see if I can't find any more vintage drafting books in person. We'll see how it goes. I have dozens of museums, uh, both institutions and house museums and smaller museums on my to-do list but I don't have a ton of individual shops to visit on my list so if you have any vintage stores or antique stores bookshops, things like that, that you think I should go check out, do leave those below for me because I will be happy to add them onto my list of places to check out. I also will be doing some fabric shopping, of course, while I'm in London. I have um, lived there before for about five months back in 2012. That was the last time I was there. So I do know my way around 
around pretty well and I have been to many places before. So I'll be revisiting old favorites and hitting up some new spots as well. And I will be sharing the highlights of my trip with you, of course, once I get back. I can go ahead and sew the side seams of my sleeve patterns together. So under and over sleeve together. I'm gonna sew along the front uh, seam of this, the like, more forward facing seam of this first. That way I can press this flat, top stitch this seam. I won't be able to top stitch the back in the same way, at least not with my machine. So um, I'm, want, I wanted to do the seam first that I wanted to have top stitching on, which is gonna be the front. It's the more visible seam as it were. But I am just using my half inch seam allowance as usual using black Guterman all-purpose thread over here on the Singer 99K. And then I will sew the other things I pinned already as well, like these side seams of my front and back bodice pieces for this jacket. I need like a different term for when it's a jacket instead of a dress, because it seems weird to call it a bodice, but it is like the bodice piece of the jacket. And then the little skirt pieces I call peplum pieces usually, even though they're not a peplum, it's just the lower part of the jacket. But again, terminology. Is that my strong suit? No, uh, winging it and being a bit messy is my strong suit, so, oh well. And then I will do the side seams for the peplum pieces as well here. These are nice straight-ish seams. They're just curved a tiny bit at the top near the waist. No problem there. Take all that I just sewed over here onto the ironing board and learn that, oh, I can't press this because of the rubberized coating on that. It's gonna melt it. So I need to grab a piece of muslin to use as a press cloth for all my seams with this rubberized fabric. What great news. Love an additional step, <laughs> always. So I can use this piece of muslin as a pressing cloth to be able to press my seams. I still want to give them a good press and they press pretty well for something that has a rubberized coating on it, but I just can't put the metal of the iron directly onto that. And this press cloth even sticks to it a little bit. You can see when I go to peel it off, it's all right. All's well that ends well. Um, I'm a big fan. Well, I'm not a big fan of ironing, but I'm a big fan of having nicely finished garments. So pressing is a big part of sewing. I'm going to go ahead and line up my side seams for the peplum piece and the bodice piece here on both the left and right hand sides of this and pin those together along the waist. Again, I have to sew this waist seam between these pieces along the sides before I can sew my front and back princess seams because the front and back center front and back pieces of this jacket don't have a waist seam. So I need to make sure this waist seam is sewn on these side pieces before they can go together. And again, I will press open the front style line on this sleeve for both the left and right sleeve. And I will do top stitching on this. Again, this is gonna get a little bit sticky over on my machine for top stitching. So I ended up putting a piece of scotch tape under my presser foot, which I will show you. I really need to get like a Teflon foot or a non-stick foot for this machine but I haven't figured that out yet. Not when I can just not stop the flow of what I'm doing and grab a piece of scotch tape and that works pretty well as well. So I'll show you that in a second. All right, over here on the machine again, I started trying to top stitch this and this is where I figured out, oh, this is gonna be kind of sticky. Um, basically what happens is like if you set your top stitching, like I set my machine to like a, I don't know, something large, eight stitches per inch. And if it starts getting stuck, it'll give you like a smaller stitch per inch because the feed dogs don't move it along as much as it should when this is getting stuck to the presser foot. So I did this top stitching for the sleeve and then I realized that from now on, I'm going to go ahead and put a piece of plastic on the bottom of this presser foot before I do any more. And I am currently off camera here when not editing this video, working on the set uh, being transformed a little bit and several more projects for another little mini collection that is coming up here soon. Um, I don't think I'll be able to do many lookbooks in the second half of the year, just because I might be you know, house hunting and moving. So I do have another one coming up here to the channel soon, which will involve, instead of all black garments, no black garments, not a single black garment, maybe not even a single black accessory other than eyeliner, might end up in this next lookbook. So something to look forward to for all of you who want to see me do a little bit more color. It is coming soon, but I do have to finish all that up before I leave for London. So we'll see how I do. You know me, always packing my schedule. I am uh, very good at that one, that's for sure. But I'm looking forward to relaxing, wander around London, stopping into every place that sells macaroons and buying some. I love a, a Paul Bakery macaroon. They're like massive and the chocolate ones are basically just like a huge brownie. Those are so good. That's a meal right there. Um, and then I love, of course, La Durée. Anywhere that's got French macaroons. I'm willing to stop. We'll stop for macaroons. I love a cookie and that's kind of like the height. It's like a couture cookie, you know? But over here, I'm again, pressing my seams open. I do have to put clips in my curved seams 
always clip your curves and corners. So I clipped the curved waist seam on these pieces of the side, again using that pressing cloth to be able to press that open without getting my iron melted onto those. But now I have this long back seam that I can sew the other back piece onto in a moment. And then I can, I have to sew the um, back princess seam before I can sew the yoke on as well. So again, order of operations, keeping everything in mind, what needs to happen next. And then I kind of go backwards from there. So my center back piece here, I just want to mark my waist on this because I'm going to leave from the waist down to the hem of this back piece open, which is why I added a center back seam in the first place. So I need to know where that will be, but I can go ahead and pin along the back princess seam for this between the side back and the center back pieces here. Again, we still have a left and a right here because I haven't sewn the center back uh, like line together yet, but we'll get to it. And this fabric, you know, it's a little bit bulky. It's not thick necessarily, but it's a little bit bulkier than like, I don't know, the twill because it has this wrinkled finish and like rubberized coating on it. So I thought it would be stable enough to make this blazer out of without interfacing, without, without an interlining. But the more, like the further I got into this project, the more I realized that this black fabric before it was rubberized was not a very tightly woven fabric. So the rubberization of it all was adding some structure, but not necessarily enough to do this completely unlined like this. In hindsight, I would have interfaced this fabric with a very lightweight interfacing just to give it a little bit more stability, especially when it comes to the hem later. I think that would have really helped me keep the hem looking a lot more structured um, area of this jacket. But, you know, that's what it wouldn't have, wouldn't have been nice to know these things at the start, but I slowly figured that out as it was too late, you know? I did sew the other side of my sleeve seams together here, so I can go ahead and press those open. Again, I can't top stitch these the same way I did the front because obviously it would be impossible to get in here now. So that's why I decided to do the other uh, front side of these first so that I could do the top stitching on the front. And I will go ahead and press open my back princess seams here, again, using my press cloth for that. This fabric is loosely woven enough I didn't even need to put clips in this, which is a bad sign, honestly. I, I like using a tightly woven fabric usually in life. Loosely woven fabrics, uh, they stretch and they move around too much and I don't, uh, I, I don't like fabrics to have a life of their own, other than like iridescence. Uh, playing with light, yes. Playing and moving around, no. So where the rest of this is pressed open, obviously these side pieces are longer than the center back pieces, so they just have a little bit of a hem on them. And here I am adding a piece of scotch tape to the bottom of my presser foot seat. And scotch tape is like a matte finish on it, so it doesn't stick to the rubberized material. This is how I sew uh, like all the faux patent leather and stuff like that I've ever worked with, is just doing this as well, unless I'm on the Burnett, which has different feet, but this buddy just has this standard presser foot. I only use this in the zipper foot. I have a few other attachments. I don't tend to use them. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I always advocate for these vintage machines because people are like, oh, they only have a straight stitch. Yeah, well, that's all I use. <laughs> I don't need lots of fancy stitches. Um, only when I'm sewing with knits, and we all know I try not to do that too often. But here now I can top stitch my princess seams along the back here with ease and not get too stuck to my presser foot. And once those back princess seams are top stitched, I can go ahead and sew my center back shut, um, which will allow me to finally then put my back yoke on here. Again, I'm going to leave from the waist down of this center back seam open, and I can just press that sort of slit hem in here as I press the center back open after sewing it, like so. Again, using that press cloth, always with the press cloth when it comes to this fabric. I will look forward to sewing the lining when I do not have to use the press cloth. And you can see it just stuck to it a little bit. All right, here we go. We have the back. The sides are all together. All I need to do to finish the back off here is to put the back yoke on here. And at this point, I'm realizing this is not the most stable fabric ever. So I went ahead and interfaced this back yoke. And thank goodness, because it did offer me some structure back there that I think was necessary. So just go ahead and fuse some lightweight fusible onto this fabric. Trim my little edges a little because I didn't use the pattern piece to cut that out. I just kind of winged it, but like that. But now we are interfaced before I pin this on here, but I'll line up the sides and just pin this yoke across the back of my garment here so I can sew this on. And then again, I will press this open, top stitch, 
you get the idea at this point. And yes, again, of course, I'll be top stitching this seam as well, just to coordinate with the rest of what I've got going on. So just top stitch that yoke seam as well. Okay, and then now finally I can go ahead and sew my, I guess the entire back is constructed and the sides are constructed of this. Um, we only have our side fronts going so far on the front. Um, I can go ahead and sew my side fronts to my shoulder uh, along the shoulder seam here. So that's what I've gone and done here. And then I have to put my collar on before I can do my front princess seams. So I'm going to sew my collar on next. So I have my shoulder seams sewn between the fronts and the backs and I've got those pressed open. I didn't bother top stitching those. Finding the center of my collar here, matching that up with the center of the back of my neck, and I can pin this on all around the neck here. The curve of the collar doesn't match up perfectly with the curve of the neck. I don't know that it should. This seems to work. So uh, I've been going with it. I trust the pattern drafting, as it were. But I'm gonna pin this in place. Luckily, because this collar is interfaced as well, I don't have to worry about it stretching out of shape too much. Um, you could put notches uh, about where this is supposed to line up on the front princess line on the side fronts, but obviously I have not bothered because as we know, I'm a lazy human. That's right. But I'll pin this all into place and stitch this collar on here um, before we do the front princess seams because the princess seam is almost between the collar and side front and the front as opposed to just the side front and the front itself. Like this, the princess seam goes up the extension of the collar as well so hopefully you see what's happening because I'm doing a terrible job explaining. Now of course this is curved so I need to go ahead and put some clips in here before I can press it open to make it lay nicely clipping down to the seam line but not through it of course and because I have a small stitch length I'm not worried about this coming undone in any way and I'll just press this nice and smooth. Before we continue on I will use this same order of operations to sew the lining together for this. The only difference there will be that, of course, uh, most of it is made out of lining fabric and then the collar and front panels will be made out of twill. But other than that, um, the order of operations for the steps of putting the sides together, then the back together, and then the fronts on last are going to be the same. But now that I have my collar on and everything is pressed, I can lay this out flat and grab my straighter front sections. I like to mark my notches on the outside of the curvier side of a princess seam and then on the inside of the straighter side piece and I like to pin with the curvy side down and the straighter piece on top. Hopefully you can see what I mean and I'll match up those notches first, pin from like one of the pins up to the neckline. Of course I have this other little kink in my seam here but that's all right like so. It zigs and it zags and it creates the shape we need. It's no harder to sew than a normal princess seam would be but I'll pin this smooth over the bust as well. Although I am using my larger pins to do this, which is a shame because it means I can't sew over them. What a fool. Um, I will remedy that on the next princess seam. But pin all the way down to the waist, past the waist, like so. And I can stitch that starting at the top of the collar here, down over the front of the first side of my uh, garment here. So yeah, princess seams in the front, princess seams in the back, and the weird collar that doesn't have a name. The wind is blowing something on the utility box on the other side of this wall, and I'm hoping you can't hear it. But I'll tell you what, if I ever have like a properly soundproof place to record audio, won't I be a happier camper, as it were? <sighs> All right, I can go ahead and put clips over the bust of this, a few clips in at the waist. You take little triangles out of the um, convex curves. So that's what I've done over the bust here. And I'll just press the rest of this seam allowance open all the way along. This seam, this is of course the side that has the pointier bits down here at the hem. That's right, I'll just press those for now and press the rest of this seam open. And then I will go ahead and top stitch this seam, of course, as I want to do with any fabric that can handle it, honestly. Uh, sometimes I'll work with a Lurex brocade that the Lurex threads are uh, too sensitive to top stitch the princess seams. And I made a jacket like that recently where I knew the brocade couldn't handle it, so I didn't even bother trying. That's what I get for using so many metallic brocades. Honestly, I should just be relieved using a rubberized cotton that the biggest problem is having to use a press cloth like this. Big deal. I have to clip where the collar meets the side and meets everything meets together, I guess, at this little point here. Make sure that's all clipped so it's lying smooth as can be, basically. Like 
So on the outside now looks like this. We have this very strange square shaped collar. Now if you're looking really closely you can see that actually along this side front edge I have put in a line of stay stitching. So unusual for me. But this fabric at this point I was becoming wise to its uh, wily ways as it were. So I actually put in some stay stitching along that curved edge. I know, wild. I didn't bother putting it on this straight edge, but you know, one uh, step at a time. Me putting stay stitching in is absolutely unheard of, so we'll have to take what we can get. But I'm going to pin this other princess seam here with pins I can sew over, my fine pins this time. Nice, which will save me a minuscule amount of time not having to take pins out over here on the machine. And again, putting my clips over the bust and in at the waist and then up here along the collar as well where they need to be, just so that everything can be pressed smooth once again on this side as well. Using my tailor's hem, of course, under the bust of this, anywhere that's curvy, it's usually easier to press it um, nicely over a curved ironing board. But of course the ironing board is usually flat. So having tailor's implements like a uh, like an arm you can put inside and having a tailor's hem is actually super useful to have as part of your press kit. So. Uh, the little arm sleeve thing that you see me put in here is actually just uh, bundles of yarn that I was never going to use because I figured out that I'm terrible at knitting and I stuffed them into a little cylinder of fabric like this to create an arm. So this isn't even an official pressing tool. It's just one I made quickly one time. So very easy. Just grab a tube of fabric and stuff yarn in it in my case or scraps. Uh, this is a really good thing for using up uh, lettuce. What is it called? <laughs> the fabric scraps that, you know, end up on the floor in my case little tiny bits of fabric, the little triangles I cut out from over the bust on this. If you saved enough of them, you could stuff some tailoring tools with those. But my next step for this jacket is going to be setting in my sleeves here. I will also set the sleeves into the lining as well. So I'm going to finish the outside of the jacket and the lining of the jacket. And then I will, of course, bag line them together by putting them right sides together. So before I can bag line this, I do want to go ahead and set in my sleeves to each. So that is what I'm doing here. I have a tiny bit of gathering along the sleeve cap the top of the sleeve cap to fit this sleeve in here. Um, that is not to create a gathered sleeve. It's just to have like a very, like a, it just rolls over the shoulder. It, there's usually a bit of extra ease built into a sleeve cap as opposed to the arm side. That just gives it a really super snug fit where the sleeve is just a tiny bit too big for the arm side, which is actually what you are after in pattern drafting as opposed to it fitting exactly. You do want to have your sleeve be a tiny bit quote unquote, too big so you can gather the top just a, a touch and it will curve over the curve of the shoulder. And usually I actually add a shoulder pad into my jackets, but this time, for whatever reason, I just decided not to. Once again, something I decided on the day, couldn't explain to you why now. And I will put some clips into the bottom half of my arm side. I usually do this. Uh, it just gives me the full range of motion that the lowering of the arm side like I, I lowered it that five eighths of an inch so I would have room in here and to have that full range of like movement or like non bulkiness under my arm. Sometimes I just put clips and I even put some in the top here because this rubberized fabric was being weird. Um, I will often fill the arm side like that inside here with steam and then stuff the tailor's ham in there. And then you can see I'm giving it a nice good press from the outside as well, just to coax the seam allowance into the sleeve, like away from the body of the jacket into the sleeve kind of what's going on there. But yes, I set my sleeves into my lining as well. Now I can go ahead and match up my outside of my jacket and my lining right sides together. I'm lining the collar up first. This is a nearly a straight line across the very top of this collar. Um, it was seeing a picture of one of these, this style of jacket laid out like this that finally clued me into what the shape of this needed to be. So it really is like a square with a jacket attached into it to create this collar shape. I'm sure there's an easier way to do it than the way that I figured out how to draft it, but you know. I, I got some place that worked and I stayed there. I don't, I don't need to keep looking at this point because I was coming up empty on the internet there. But I'll go all the way along the outsides of this, leaving a couple of blank spaces along the hem for me to get my hands in there later, help hook out these corners. I can always slip stitch little slits in this hem closed later. So I'll leave part of the back open, um, the center back area open so I can turn this right side out through the back. All that jazz. And of course, I'll just need to run that all through the machine with my half inch seam allowance, leaving the needle down around corners. You've seen me maneuver things like this before. I do like to put in a bag lining, although I really need to improve my uh, lining of my blazers and jacket kind of things um, to try and step up to more proper tailoring techniques where you set the lining in a different way. Um, so 
I promise I will upgrade eventually here. I'm, I'm, up, I'm upgrading one little detail at a time. And we haven't gotten past bag lining yet, but we might get there soon. I did just invest in a 1940s tailoring book to read, actually. While I was grabbing lots of pattern drafting books to add to my library, I saw a 1948 tailoring book that I picked up so I can do it the 40s way, hopefully, here soon. But yes, I'm going to clip my corners, clip my curves, turn everything right side out, and go along the edge here. Just give that a very crispy press and pin that into place. I'm not going to do any understitching on this because I will go ahead and top stitch all along the edge as well, just because I top stitched the princess seams on this and other areas of this. And so to coordinate with that, I can go ahead and top stitch around the edge of this as well. I'm actually going to slip a magnet. These are magnets for making handbags that I picked up on Etsy. I'm going to slip a magnet into two points of the collar so that it will actually help this stay closed and stay up when I'm wearing it with the collar folded up. And I'll show you how I tack those in there in a minute. Um, I just tacked them with some machine stitching because this jacket is again on the more tactical side as opposed to the like kind of couture fancy fancy side. And so I felt like I get away with having visible stitching for that. Um, you could of course invisibly stitch those in there if you wanted to. I do still have the back open here so I can slip these magnets in here. So I'm to make sure I have those going the right direction so I don't repel <laughs> the side of the collar. But I want to put one here next to this princess seam on one side and then into the edge of the other, like the corner of the other. So I'll slip this bunny up next to this princess seam. I'm going to pin the corner uh, to hold this in place, like pin through this plastic that this is uh, set into. It's a magnet laminated between two layers of plastic, really, and you can sew through the plastic. And I'll put the other one up here into this corner. So that'll help hold this up closed when I want to wear this with the collar folded all the way up, like a mask or some sort of Blade Runner style situation. But once I have that magnet in there, I can close up all the remaining openings <laughs> along between the lining and the outside of the fabric, including my sleeve hems here. And I again did top stitch these closed because again, the rest of this jacket is top stitched. Might as well just top stitch my sleeve hems as well. This is supposed to be more of a casual jacket. I feel like the cut is not very casual, but the materials are supposed to be kind of like, oh, it's like a casual leather jacket to throw on. It's all made out of cotton, except for the I mean, I guess the lining is technically kind of a rayon cotton blend as well, so nearly all cotton. But once my sleeves are hemmed, I can just attach a couple of hooks as the closure on the front of this. So I'm using some of my handy dandy skirt hooks. I love a skirt hook. I use them for everything. Uh, I wish there were a larger variety of larger skirt, skirt hooks out there. So things to look for while I'm at the fabric stores in London, perhaps. But I'm going to put the hooks on one side, the bars on the other. Just here above the waist, I'm just going to do two hooks on this buddy. Uh, most of the time I'm probably going to wear this jacket belted anyhow, but I do like the way it looks without a belt too. But with these hooks sewn on, this jacket will finally be finished, and I can style it a couple of different ways for you. Here is my finished black and gray rubberized cotton jacket. I think in hindsight, I probably would have interfaced the rest of this rubbery fabric just so that it was a little bit stiffer and laid a little bit smoother. But that's the kind of thing you can only really find out after you start working with the darn fabric, which is unfortunate, but true. I'm still really thrilled with how this jacket came out and I can't wait to wear it in all its different formations and different foldable options because of course the look changes quite dramatically depending on how I have the collar folded. Hopefully I can bring this to London with me. I'm going on a trip to London soon, um, although I am trying to pack light. So we'll see how many outfits I end up bringing. It's gonna be a lot of mix and match of black and things I can wash in the sink and my hotel room. So the outfits might not be that exciting. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this project came together today and thank you as always for watching. I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming, and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.